Yeah, what I was saying at the point that we changed the tape is that the author points out that uh, people sneak things into what a, a looks like an objective discussion of things, you know, just the definition of terms. And what they're sneaking in is their own attitude or evaluation or the emotive impact that they want for a term as a way of persuading their, um, their hearers. And we come to some exercises on page uh, 138. I said in section one that I wanted you to create your own illustrations. Uh, the question comes up with respect to my assignment, whether you were supposed to give different kinds of definitions for the same word. And uh, if you'll stop and think about it, that would be impossible, wouldn't it? Because a lexical definition is a word that's already in common use and a stipulative definition will be given to a word that is newly created for a particular purpose. And so, no, the assignment could not have been to use the same word and then give it a lexical, a stipulative, or precising, a theoretical. There are some words that you don't ordinarily think a theory is associated with. You don't give a theoretical definition of a bachelor. Um, I suppose somebody, I take it back, somebody might have a theory about bachelors and offer that this is the part of their definition, though it's unlikely. Anyway, let's go through number one then. I ask you to create your own illustrations for these five different kinds of definitions. And for the sake of time, I'm going to um, uh, just be selective. We'll have um, Pete do that. Oh. Mm-hmm. That's pretty good. I don't know if I did this right. I didn't. Well, that's why we're going over it, okay. so we learn. I right. want you all to get rid of any sense of pride or worry about this. If you make mistakes, that's what I'm here to help you learn about, be trained in. So go ahead. For lexical definitions, mm -hmm. I, I wrote down deflagrate. It means to burn or cause to burn with intense heat and light. Just <laughs> I have to take you at your word. I assume you got that from the dictionary. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Go ahead. You want me to give both examples? Of what? Of uh, the lexical definition. It says two. Uh, uh, didn't you decide to give one of each? One of each. Oh. Okay. Did you do two of each? Yes. I did. Well, see, you're doubly smart today. <laughs> <laughs> or All doubly right. stupid, whatever it <laughs> may be. <laughs> Stipulative. For a stipulative, I put down facts, and then we could stipulate that as being a facsimile, like a fax machine would be a facsimile. You shorten the word facsimile. So give me your definition. See, that's where I didn't. I just gave examples. I didn't define them. But that, no, wait a minute. The example was supposed to be of a definition. Exemplify a definition for me now that would be stipulative. Give me a word okay. and stipulate its definition. So would it be facts and then another... By the word facts, I take by the word using F-A-X. Yes. By the word facts, I mean... Facsimile. We can't use the same... We can, but uh, that would be stipulating the definition. It's a novel term, and you give the definition you want to it. By facts, I will mean facsimile. Okay. okay. You seem hesitant. I don't know why. Because it's very foggy to me. Well, but st okay, stipulative okay. definition is the easiest one because you get to make up the term and use it any way you want. Okay. So would would it be correct to say by facsimile or by facts I mean facsimile? That would be correct. Now let me okay. tell you what's wrong with it. Okay. Uh, what's not as strong as it might be. It's an illustration. The fact is that the word facts does have common usage. Okay. It may not be real old. I mean, only within the last, you know, say five years or something. But so you've taken something and you've sti you've taken a term that is in common parlance, and you probably should try to bring a uh, completely novel approach. But you might say, well, I'm, I'm adding a new definition, a stipulative definition to it. 
we got to move on. Precising definition. No, I did this all wrong, but I just, just gave an example of euthanasia. And how, right. how are you going to precise it? Um, it would, euthanasia means the point at which someone decides whether or not that person's life is worth living. No, I don't think that would be a definition of euthanasia, offering a more precise thing. I mean, you're talking, you're trying to describe what takes place in the case of euthanasia, but that's not a definition of euthanasia. The term euthanasia means what? And then if you're going to give a precising definition, what would the precising definition be? Um, youth. Yeah. No. Let me give you an example of a precising definition. Any, any of the rest of you struggling with this? Okay, I'm trying to figure out why that is. Um, okay, if 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 the word pornography means the um, the public portrayal of things that are considered obscene. A precising definition of pornography would be the public portrayal of, of obscenity in the sex act itself. There are other kinds of obscenity. But somebody might say, for my purposes, when I use the term pornography today, I'm going to meet precisely now just the portrayal of the sex act on the screen. And yet that isn't... Um, Pornography is not ordinarily that narrow a term. So what I've done is I've precised, I've made more precise within the realm of standard usage what I will mean. I will stipulate that in my lecture I mean by pornography now portraying the sex act in a movie. Now, does that help to show the relationship between a lexical definition and a precising definition? The precising definition narrows the field with within what a lexical definition would be. So can you, Doesn't that relate to stipulative then? Yes, and, and remember that in our explanation we said precising definition is a combination of stipulative and lexical. It's lexical in that it has to be a standard usage within the realm of standard usage. It's stipulative in that you choose, you stipulate to narrow it to a precise point. Yes. Sin, it's like what's common in the catechism. Like sin is anyone It said you could have a vague general interpretation of sin, whereas catechism is more precise. Uh, I would not have chosen that illustration, but as you've explained it, I suppose you could look at that as a precising definition. That is, you could say, if you look at what sin is in Webster's dictionary. It can mean, you know, all sorts of things, including what is uh, publicly reproachable and stuff like that. But the catechism wants to narrow it down, although you know very well they weren't narrowing a lexical definition. They were really giving a theoretical definition of sin. You take my what about now, I want to make sure you understand this. Do you understand why that's better an illustration of a theoretical definition? Because they're laying out what, in, from their perspective, is the essence of sin, their theory of sin. Okay, A precising definition is one that is narrower than would be ordinarily found in common parlance or the dictionary. So and you choose to narrow it for, the, for a special purpose. They aren't narrowing it, they're redefining the lexical based on Not theory. redefining narrowing the definition. But in the theoretical... Oh, in the theoretical... More, more properly, then, it wouldn't be an example of, of precising. It would be more an example of theoretical because they're saying the defi lexical definition say Webster was wrong. This is what it actually is. It's not going... It's not narrowing. No, actually, you see, Webster's dictionary doesn't give you a theoretical definition of anything. It doesn't offer a theory or a philosophical point of view explaining things. It tries to uh, simply show the use of a term in a linguistic community. Webster's Dictionary is, in a funny sense, a history book. It's a report of how people have lived, how they have behaved. 
they have used this word in this way, this word in that way, and so forth. Now, a theoretical definition says, regardless of how people have talked about it, this is how you explain atoms. This is how you explain justice. And so you offer a theory on this subject in the form of a definition. This is how you should think of it. That's not a history of the word. That's a scientific account or a philosophical account of the word or the concept that the word names. Let's keep at this because we need to understand it. It's crucial. Um, I don't know how many of you have read my book, Theonomy and Christian Ethics. In my discussion of Matthew 5.17, I talk about this word, fulfill. Jesus says, I didn't come to abrogate, but to fulfill. And then I go into a discussion of how that term should be precisely understood in this context. And I, and I have said, I think the word fulfill in that context has the thrust of to confirm in full measure. Now, I've had critics say um, in response, and they've shown, I think, very little appreciation, uh, whether they agree or disagree, very little appreciation of what is being attempted here when they make the criticism. They'll say, oh, no, the Greek word means fulfill. It doesn't mean confirm. I want to pull out my hair and say, I know the Greek word means fulfill, but of the many different ways in which fulfill is understood, which one did Jesus mean? I'm not now trying to redefine pleirao. I'm trying to precisely define within the realm of possible uses for that Greek term. What precisely... Now, does that help? That illustration? I'm taking a term and saying, this is what it means precisely in this situation. I'm stipulating... Well, of course, I can't stipulate what it will mean when I'm doing biblical exegesis. Um, but I, in a sense, I'm stipulating that what Jesus meant was confirm, fulfill in the sense of confirm. I will stipulate for this afternoon's lecture that when I speak of pornography, I will not mean everything that people might use the word pornography for. I will only be referring to pornography as graphic portrayals of the sex act. And that's a precising definition of the word pornography. It's partly stipulative, but I can't stipulate anything. I've got to stay within the realm of what the standard or lexical definition of pornography would be. Okay. Melissa, can you give me a theoretical definition? You pick that one. Um, I use Adam, but I didn't have science book to look it up, and I didn't want to look it up in the lexical dictionary. So I just wait a minute, wait a minute. You didn't want to look it up in the lexical dictionary? Because it, then it wouldn't be. Then, then it wouldn't be theoretical. A theoretical. Okay. When you said you didn't want to, I'm oh, sorry. I think what Please. you should have said is it would do no good to okay. look it up in a dictionary because that would give me the lexical definition. Okay. Okay. So what'd you give then? I just said an atom. As an amateur scientist, what did you? Give? An atom is made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Very good. It's not the most sophisticated, but it nevertheless is a theoretical definition of an atom. What, what happens when the theoretical definition coincides with the lexical definition? Will uh, it ever? I'm worried that you asked that question because lexical definitions are a report on usage. Theoretical definitions give a philosophy or a scientific explanation of something. And so it's when you say, will, will they never coincide? Well, I suppose they could, but it would be very bizarre. It would be very unusual. Because dictionaries are not trying to give theories. Science books and philosophy books and theology books give theories. Dictionaries report on how people use terms. And people rarely use terms theoretically. They just use them in the ordinary, vague, general Sense. How, how would a dictionary define atom then? Probably something like the smallest um, unit of uh, matter, uh, something like that. Oh, but then okay. the way in which Einstein would define an atom, or Niels Bohr would define an atom theoretically would be different than uh, some later scientists. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. On some theories, an atom is splittable. Given the dictionary definition, it is by definition unsplittable. So isn't that a strange thing? Here, here is a theory of atoms such that the dictionary is wrong because it says it's the smallest. If it's the smallest, it can't be divided. So you see how theoretical and dictionary definitions really don't relate to each other very much. Now, there's some connection because uh, why would a scientist want to be defining um, an atom or matter or why would a philosopher want to define justice if we didn't talk about atoms and matter and justice? So they will be common terms rather than stipulated terms, but the attempt is now to give an account of and an explanation for what that concept is or what that thing is. Okay, persuasive definitions. Jay, give me one. Well, I took the word inertia and I tried to basically give all five on it. And I said, when I say he has inertia, I mean that he's a lazy person. I, mean, I don't know whether that would f follow as a persuasive definition or not. A, a persuasive definition would be, by inertia, I mean lazy. Okay, so I wasn't on that track. Yeah, I, although I can't imagine very easily a sentence in which you would use inertia of a person like that. Well, neither do I. But it's just well, but I the have. assignment calls for you to give a persuasive definition, one that would be usable. It's not just any universe in which we're speaking. But in this universe, in our linguistic community, what would be a persuasive definition, um, Pat? You have a janitor, is a sanitary maintenance engineer, Ah, that's excellent, excellent. Now, why is that? Um, well, it, it may not be excellent in terms of what you want to say, but as an example of trying to define something in a persuasive way, what has Pat done here? Has he built in some kind of emotive impact to his definition? Right. So he's not giving the genus and species of janitor. He's, he's trying to make a janitor look better than what most people would say. So that's... A, that's that's very good. Kind of like uh, when uh, Mayor Rubin in Sacramento wanted to change the name of manholes to something like personnel interest lines or something strange like that. I think that's probably more a humorous use of language than a serious attempt to uh, persuade people by defining a term in a certain way. Uh, Melissa, what's your definition, your persuasive definition? Um, I had homosexuality and my persuasive definition was um, um, it, I don't even know if right. a sin uh, a sin committed a sexual sin committed when one person are the same and, and another with, I can't even do it right with one person of the, with two people of the same sex Okay, now why why is that a persuasive definition rather than say a lexical definition? Because it's calling the same in some people. Very good. I wasn't I wasn't sure if you understood your own illustration, but you do. That's great. By building in the evaluation that it's a sin, then you have now a persuasive rather than a lexical definition. What would the lexical definition of homosexuality be? One uh, one person who sexual relations within one gender. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that someone could use the term homosexual and yet not be using it as though it were a sin. Many people do. But when Christians define homosexuality as the sin of doing the following, now they're using a persuasive definition. By the way, does that make it wrong to do that? No, but if I get into an argument with a gay rights activist or something and I have defined homosexuality as the sin of uh, having sex you know, within your own gender then obviously what he's going to say is well then there is no homosexuality given your definition there is no homosexuality I'll say you mean to say there's no uh, sex going on within one person's gender and he'll say oh no that is but there's no sin going on of that sort so you see Persuasive definitions have some value, but they also have a weakness. That if you're going to try to resolve a dispute using a persuasive definition, it's not going to help you. Okay. Hey, Melissa, you have a question about uh, these kinds of definitions? Um, 
Yes, the precise definition. I want to, and I'm not sure if I have it or not. With something like civil rights, the definition would be guaranteed to every person like the ring in pursuit of happiness. Would that be a precise definition? What is the, you're defining civil rights mm -hmm. and you're defining it as? The guarantee to every person, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Yeah, you're reading that from the textbook? No, but I was my pencil marker. Oh, I, see. I wasn't sure if there was an illustration I should be looking at. The guarantee of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? I suppose the only reason I'm hesitant is that that's not very precise. Okay. That's what I just um, but if you're thinking of civil rights as being something broader than that in common use, and now I'm just going to talk about it in this sense, then it would be precise thing. Okay. But you see, since it doesn't look very precise, I'm hesitant about your illustration. Okay. Okay, in section, go ahead. I was going to say, whereas something like adultery, which can have more than a sexual connotation, uh -huh. I could say, uh, I mean, explicitly, uh, the sex acts between one and one, two people, yes. and one of them is married. Exactly. Where um, the catechism, the Westminster Catechism, uses adultery for a broad range of of sins, some sexual, some not, but even if you just thought of all sex sins as adultery, you could say, but when I use the word adultery, I'm going to mean between a married person and somebody that he or she's not married to. Okay. The catechism definition would be more of a uh, theoretical. Um, I'm not so sure whether that's offering a theory of adultery, trying to get at the essence of it or explain it as it is trying to enumerate all the different ways in which it uh, expresses itself. Okay, section 2 on page, uh, beginning on page 138, discuss each of the following disputes. If it, ob if it is obviously genuine, indicate each of the disputers' positions with respect to the proposition at issue. If it is merely verbal, resolve it by explaining the different senses attached to the disputers by the disputers to the key word or phrase that is used ambiguously. If it is apparently verbal dispute that's really genuine, locate the ambiguity, explain the real disagreement involved. And um, why don't I try to do one for you? Will that help? I'm going to... You all have number one explained for you by the author, so I'm going to avoid that one um, and do number three, I guess. I'll just arbitrarily choose that. Day says... Bob Jones is certainly a wonderful father to his children. He provides a beautiful home in a fine neighborhood, buys them everything they want, need or want, and has made ample provision for their education. Knight says, I don't think Bob Jones is a good father at all. He's so busy getting and spending that he has no time to be with his children. They hardly know him except as somebody who pays the bills. What we have here is obviously a disagreement over how the expression wonderful or good father is used. So you do have at least a verbal disagreement. Is it merely verbal? If we were to define wonderful father, probably they would agree on all the facts. He gives them a nice home, buys them everything they want, and as well, he's always working and he's never there for them. So it doesn't appear that they have a disagreement in belief about what actually takes place. They are using a term differently. But now, if we just define good father in a certain way, will their disagreement go away? I don't think so. Because I think not only would they um, agree on the facts and how to use the term, they would disagree as to whether this is a good guy or not, a good father or not there would be a continuing disagreement as to attitude toward him. So I would say number three is apparently verbal but genuine. Did you all get the same thing when you tried to do your homework? Because if you didn't, I'd like to work through any glitches that you might have. Okay, since you did, let me call on one of you now to do one. Um, Pete, would you please do number four for us? Amalgamated general corporations' earnings were higher than ever last year, I see by reading their annual report. The other guy says, no, their earnings were really much lower than in the preceding year, and they've been cited by the SEC for issuing a false and misleading report. 
Um, I said that's a genuine dispute because day says earnings are higher and night says reports are false. So yeah, by simply but by the P, you've got to realize that though one says this and one says the other, why do they say one and the other thing? Because, because one is looking at the report and the other saying the report is faulty. Okay. So now would the person who says the report is faulty say, oh, the report doesn't say that the earnings were higher. You're wrong. No. You're no. Wrong. He would agree with them. The report does say that they're higher. Okay. 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 So this is a merely verbal dispute. There's no reason for us to think that they have any remaining disagreement when we say we will define in the following way what it means for the earnings to be higher. Well, now come to think of it. They do know how to use the terms higher and lower. They're not disagreeing over them. They're disagreeing over uh, whether they, in fact, were higher or lower. What's the answer you had given? Now, I'm going to back up and maybe Gen change. I said it was a genuine dispute. Yeah. Genuine dispute. And um, the reason why I jumped in there, and I think I made this mistake, is it appears that because they're using a different standard of judgment that you could resolve their dispute. The person who says, no, they really didn't have higher earnings would be willing to say, oh yeah, the report said they did. But then he go on to say, I have more information. The report is faulty. Okay, so back that out. I'm going to go with your first answer. I think that it is a genuine dispute as to the facts. Okay. Uh, Melissa, why don't you try number six? Anne is an excellent student. She takes a lively interest in everything and asks very intelligent questions in class. The other side says, Anne is one of the worst students I've ever seen. She never gets her assignments in on time. Um, I think it's a merely verbal argument because they disagree on what the student is. And I think if that they, they might don't, agree because they don't I, disagree on what a student is. What an excellent excellent student, student is. is. Okay. What an excellent student is. And well then, well then it possibly could be genuine. I wasn't considering excellent student. Do they disagree as to the facts? Yeah, I think it. No. No. They, they could both say that she takes a lively interest and asks good questions, and they could both say she doesn't get her assignments in on time. Mm -hmm. okay. But they do have a disagreement as to whether that makes her an excellent student, right? Mm -hmm. So do they have a verbal dispute, merely verbal dispute? I think so. I think it's apparently verbal. Apparently verbal? Because after they resolve the disagreement over how they're using the term, I think one will still say I, I, one's evaluation or attitude is positive and the other's evaluation or attitude is negative. So they have a disagreement in attitude about Anne. Why would that be different than being merely a verbal dispute? Or because when it's merely a verbal dispute, once you clear up the ambiguity, there's no disagreement left at all. And I'm saying we could clear up the ambiguity on the expression excellent student, and you would still have a disagreement here. How oh, is apparently verbal different than verbal but genuine? Apparently verbal is the same thing as... What, what did, how did you put that? Maybe I missed it. Verbal but genuine. No, it can't be verbal but genuine. It has to be apparently verbal but genuine. Okay. Well, so that's what this would be then. This so is apparently verbal, but genuine. Because okay. once you take away the ambiguity, I think there's a remaining dispute. Hmm. Oh, okay. So that is. I'm open to hear you. I mean, you've seen I make my mistakes jumping in here too quick. Have I missed something here? 
If not, then I'm going to have Pat do number nine. Betty finally got rid of that old Chevy of hers and bought herself a new car. She's driving a Buick now. The other guy says, no, Betty didn't buy herself a new car. That Buick is a good three years old. This is a verbal disagreement. It pivots off of what the definition of a new car is. A new car needs to be clarified. You don't think that they have a remaining disagreement if uh, that uh, dispute is cleared up over how to use the expression new car? No. There wouldn't be any. There should clear everything up. Very good. I'm just doing that because I, I want to see if I can push you off your answer. Yeah, this is a good illustration, it seems to me, of what is only a verbal dispute. Merely verbal dispute. Okay, let's move ahead in the book. Section 4.3 deals with denotation and connotation, or if you will, extension and intention. The author says he now wants to look at the literal meaning of terms, but specifically general terms, class terms. And he says the objects to which a term may be correctly applied, the set of objects, to which the term may be correctly applied is called the extensional meaning of the term or the denotative meaning of the term. All the objects within the extension of a given term have a common attribute or attributes that leads us to use the same term to denote them. And since we um, have the, this common attribute or characteristic or set of characteristics, we may know the meaning of a term without knowing its extension. I may know uh, the meaning of um, a term that applies to a particular kind of animal, but not know the objects or the number of objects you know to which it applies. I may know the characteristics that are given to define that thing. The intentional or connotive meaning of the term is the totality of attributes shared by all and only those objects within a term's extension. Bottom of page 141. The totality of attributes shared by all and only those objects within a term's extension. And on page 142, he discusses the relationship of extension to intention, and just above the middle says, any term with a changing extension must have a changing intention also. But if you change the class of objects to which a term applies, then you've changed the meaning or intention of that term or expression. And then he says, note that the extension of a term the objects to which it applies, is determined by its intention, the common characteristics that are stated. But the reverse is not true. The extension is determined by intention, but intention is not determined by extension. And to be cautious here, we should remember that um, terms may have different intentions and yet the same extension. Terms may have different intentions and yet the same extension. For instance, the term creature with a heart and the term creature with a kidney have different intentions, don't they? I'm not talking about the same characteristic. And yet they have identical extensions because all creatures with hearts are creatures with kidneys. And so again, terms may have different intentions and yet the same extension. Creature with the heart, creature with the kidney have different intentions, but they apply to the same objects. On the other hand, terms with different extensions cannot possibly have the same intention. So if we have one group of people over here that includes um, Dr. Bonson 
and then another group of people that's identical to that first group except that it excludes Dr. Bonson, then the way in which you describe or define those groups cannot be identical because I'm excluded from one and included in the other. Terms with different extensions cannot possibly have the same intention. You have two different ways of describing those groups. That should be pretty obvious. When attributes are added to the intention of a term, we say the intention increases. It's one thing to talk about cows. It's another thing to talk about black cows. It's another thing to talk about black cows in Michigan. We keep increasing the intention. And then the suggestion has been made that extension and intention always vary inversely. Okay, the extension of the term cow will decrease when I add the intention black cow. Okay, so extension gets smaller as intention increases. The author points out that's not entirely correct, though. The extension might not decrease, but could remain the same. So that possibility is there, too. Notice also on page 143, he says the extension of terms can sometimes be empty. Isn't that right? I can have a term that has plenty of meaning, has intention, and yet doesn't extend to any objects at all. Fairy giraffes with butterfly wings. You know what I'm talking about. But there aren't any fairy giraffes with butterfly wings to which that applies. You get the point? And he adds here, it does not follow simply from the fact that a term has connotation or meaning that it denotes or points to anything. <clears throat> I was on a, <clears throat> pardon me, a radio talk show <clears throat> a few months ago where representatives of different religious perspectives are there answering questions. And I was supposed to be the Protestant that night, but they happened to invite two Protestants. So they had me plus a, another fellow who was a Baptist preacher and a Jewish fellow and a Roman Catholic. And at one point, a uh, call-in person wanted to know why we believe in God, and, and so we were all giving our answers. Well, the Baptist fellow offered uh, an answer that was just positively embarrassing to me. But uh, he said to the caller, he said, well, what do you mean by the term God? So the guy gives some, you know, characterization or definition. He says, well, then how could you talk about it if there isn't a God? And I sat there and I wanted to go, I cannot believe this guy's doing it. Well, the mistake he's making is what's re referred to right here. It does not follow simply from the fact that a term has connotation that it denotes anything. So later in the program, in a, an attempt to be gentle, you know, and, and to dismiss that kind of thing, I said, well, you know, we can define terms like Santa Claus, and that doesn't mean that there's something it actually points to. So the author here is, is just, you know, you can have a term like unicorn, and there's nothing in that class of unicorns. Let's just remember then that uh, connotation does not prove that there is factual denotation. Now, we have some exercises on page 143. We are to arrange each of the following groups of terms in order of increasing intention. And let's just take one of these, get down with it real quickly. I'll take number three as an illustration. We have the terms athlete, ball player, Baseball player, fielder, infielder, shortstop. Oh, I hope this is easy for you. I mean, is it? Did anybody have trouble with this? I don't want to, I'm not trying to make fun of anything. But I mean, this is almost like when you were a kid learning to put the smaller, you know, cup inside the bigger cup inside the bigger cup, right? So what's the biggest cup here or the biggest class here? It would be athletes. Okay. Now let me increase the intention. This is supposed to be increasing intention. So we go from athlete to ball player. Now this isn't hard. They put it in increasing intention for you. <laughs> it's athlete, then ball player athlete, then baseball player, ball player athlete, then 
fielder, baseball player, ball player, athlete, than infielder, shortstop. Okay, so the term shortstop has a greater intention than does the term athlete. You all get the point? This is easy. Mm -hmm. Let's move on. 4.4, extension and denotative definitions. Is, is it proper to say increasing extension? You, well, you can. There's a way to uh, to increase the extension by decreasing the by intention. decreasing the intention. Okay. Huh. All right. So I I go from um, baseball player to athlete, and all of a sudden I have increased the extension of what I'm talking about. Okay. 4.4 extension and denotative definition. Denotative definitions rely upon te techniques that identify the extension of the general term being defined. To define denotatively is to give examples. Okay? And we do that many times, right? We, we give examples of things to tell people how we're using a term or what it means. So, um, by athlete, what I mean is um, baseball players, football players, hockey players, um, skiers, skaters, boxers. Now, do you understand what I mean by an athlete? Somebody says, yeah, I kind of get the point. However, there are limitations to defining things by example or denotatively. The author says, even if we could give a complete enumeration of the objects denoted by one of those uh, general terms, the denotative definition would fail to distinguish it from other, from the other term that denotes the same objects. That is, the, the defect in the denotative definition is that after I've given a list of things, there may be another way of describing the same things that are in that list. And so I have two expressions now. Um, see if I can give an example. What? Well, the obvious example is the creature with heart, creature with kidney one that we used previously. And somebody else says, what do you mean by a creature with a heart? And I say, oh, okay, well, I mean cows and um, human beings and aardvarks and on and on and on. And let's say I gave a complete enumeration of every creature that has a heart. Well, the problem is that enumeration would not distinguish it from creatures with kidney, because all creatures with hearts have kidneys as a natural fact. And so then we wouldn't be able to distinguish between the term or expression creature with a heart from the expression creature with a kidney. But even beyond that, see, that's assuming that we have a complete enumeration. The author says very few terms can have their extensions completely enumerated. There are very few things that you can enumerate every single object in that class. What if I were to try to enumerate the class of men? Well, of course, I couldn't do that. I couldn't even enumerate the class of automobiles or puppy dogs. You know, or numbers, on and on and on. So what do you do when you can't enumerate the entire class? Well, then you give a partial enumeration. And that creates um, the same kind of problem that I've just mentioned, but even greater. When you give a partial enumeration, the fact of the matter is that, that there are other terms that might denote the class of those very things you've enumerated. Okay, so here I'm going to give a partial enumeration of the term human being. By human being, I mean like Dr. Bonson and Pete and Melissa and Jay. Pat. Somebody says, oh, I understand what human beings are. They're people that meet in a certain room and study logic every morning. <laughs> you see, what I'm getting, you know, oh, well now I know human being is the same as Presbyterian. 
theological conviction or something of that nature. The point is, whatever is true of all of us is not going to be just one thing. It would be very unlikely. And so, you know, people with hair on their head, that's what you mean by human being, right? No. So a, a partial enumeration leaves us <clears throat> in, a, in a situation where we can't distinguish the meaning of one term from another. It's so uh, it's inadequate as a definition to use a partial enumeration. Uh, on page 145, the author talks about another kind of uh, a special kind of denotative definition called demonstrative or ostensive. Here I define by pointing at things. By cow I mean, and then I point, 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 point. What's wrong with um, defining by ostension or by pointing using some gesture? Well, you have not only the problem we've just mentioned, that if I point at three cows, someone will say, oh, you mean objects in a field. There are other ways of describing those three uh, those three things. At these right here, because obviously there are church views elsewhere also. Perhaps more devastating is the fact that gestures are invariably ambiguous. What I mean by paper is this right here. I make the gesture pointing to this. Now, because you already know what paper is and you know how gesture is used, that's not going to be a problem for you. But think about it. If you didn't know those things, if I said, I mean by paper, now you might think I'm referring to book instead of what makes up the book. But worse, if I say paper, just, you might think that this is paper if you don't know the, the, the gesturing um, conventions in our culture. Isn't that right? I mean, if I go like this, is this being used to point out what the paper is? Or is this being used to point out what the paper is? Ludwig Wittgenstein, you know, once put it this way. It seems humorous, but it's true. When you look at an arrow, how do you know which way it's pointing? Because of a social convention. You know, we could have a convention that indicates that this lays out, as it were, like a ballpark, the field of consideration, and this is the pointer. So that <laughs> the arrow is not pointing that way, but actually the opposite. It could be used as a pointer this way, right? Kind of like a little dealy that points. Instead, we put the arrow, the head of the arrow on it like that. That's a social convention. So you gesturing will only help to find something if you already understand the uh, gesturing technique. And so since um, gestures themselves must be learned, obviously no one can learn all of their language, the definition of terms, by gestures. And the author points out children do not learn everything by gestures. When we point at a ball, you know, for our child and say ball, how do you know they're not learning the color when you point at it instead of the shape, the object itself? And he says on the top of page 146, the primary way of learning to use language is by observation and imitation, not by definition. And then one final defect, he says, there are words which, although perfectly meaningful, do not denote anything at all and therefore cannot be defined denotively, denotatively. Um, try defining unicorn denotatively. Now, there, you can think, well, okay, I can draw a picture of one. But then again, what's on the paper is not a unicorn. That's supposed to be a picture of a unicorn. But uh, nevertheless, things that... Um, are meaningful but do not exist, cannot be pointed to. And so, having shown the defects of denotative definition, the last sentence is crucial. He says, clearly, intention is the real key to definition, and to it we turn in the following section. 
we've gone through this primarily to see the inadequacy of denotative definition. Okay, on page 146, I ask you to do um, numbers 1 and 2, uh, Roman numerals 1 and 2, paying attention to 1, 3, 4, 6, and 9. Okay, the, um, the assignment calls for you to define uh, certain terms that are given here by example, enumerating three examples for each term, and then on the other hand, for that term, find a non-synonymous general term that your three examples serve equally well to illustrate. Okay, so this will help drive home the lesson. And I'm just going to take um, a couple of them and just work through it. Let's take number three, and uh, Jay, would you please be the guinea pig? Okay, for examples, for composers, I just took three musicians, uh, three, co three uh, composers, uh, Bach, Handel, Mozart, and then for a, of course you all knew I picked those. <laughs> I picked the same one. And for the non-synonymous general term, I said they were also musicians, since it's not really synonymous. Okay, very good. So here you have a case where you've enumerated um, certain members of a class, and then lo and behold, there's another term that they also would fit into. Very good. That's number three. Um, let's take number nine. Pat. Oh, for Ben Franklin. Um, ben Franklin, Eli Whitney, and Newton. Okay, so now you're, you're defining... Uh, enumerating examples of inventors. Yeah. Ben Franklin, Eli Whitney, and, and, and Newton, and when I for my non synonymous general term, I put uh, scientists. Okay, uh, that 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 fits. They are three scientists. They're also three scientists who happen to be inventors. We also could have you know put down that they were English speakers or human beings or males, something like that. Okay, moving on to 4.5, intention and connotative definition now. On page 147, about two-thirds of the way down, he says, normally the term connotation is used to mean conventional connotation. Let's just remember that we're dealing here with what is ordinarily taken as the meaning of a term, conventionally. How does one actually go about defining a word? What techniques does one use to identify its conventional intention, the agreed upon set of attributes common and peculiar to objects denoted by the word. And he offers three different ways in which this is done. First of all, synonymous definition. Um, trying to give a uh, two terms which are interchangeable. He says on page 148, Synonymous definitions are virtually useless in the construction of precising or of theoretical definitions. That should be obvious to you. Synonymous definitions would be useless if you're trying to precise a term. Well, if the two terms that you're dealing with are synonymous, then one is not more precise than the other. Okay. A second way to define terms is operationally giving some describable set of actions or operations or responses by which something is identified and used in a society. He says, an operational definition of a term states that the term is correctly applied to a given case if and only if the performance of specified operations in that case yield a specified result. These will be public and repeatable operations. And we find operational definition utilized, especially in the sciences, psychologists, and social scientists have recently tried to do uh, operational definitions. And when they do, they tend to be behaviorist in their theory of society or of human nature, interestingly enough. The third way to define a term apart from synony uh, synonymous expressions or operational expressions, is to define by genus and difference. Um, this depends on the fact, he says, that some attributes are complex. Uh, 
that we can analyze things into two or more attributes. Another way of putting it, he says, page 149, classes having members may have their memberships divided into subclasses. And so here's where we get genus and species. The wider class is the genus, the subclass is the species. Genus and species are relative terms. Sometimes um, a term is a genus term, sometimes it's a species term. A class um, is a collection of entities having some common characteristic. So that in general all members of all species of a, of a given genus share some attribute that makes them members of the genus, but the members of any one species share some further attribute that differentiates them. This is called the specific difference. If man is a rational animal, then we're saying that um, humans, bears, whales, and so forth have something in common, that they are animals. But the specific difference with respect to man is that he's the rational animal. So that's something that men have in common, but not the bears and the whales and the giraffes and so forth. Now on page 150, he makes an important concession that there are limitations to definition by genus and species. In the first place, it's applicable only to words that connote complex attributes. When you're dealing with something that is simple, that is to say something that cannot be analyzed further or divided up further, simple unanalyzable attributes can't be defined by genus and species. Color words are often given as an example of that. Moreover, words that connote universal attributes, object, entity, being, um, because of their universality, cannot be defined by genus and species, because they aren't a species of something even more general. Things that are in the very highest class and ultimate metaphysical categories, he says, um, cannot be defined this way. A metaphysical category would be like substance and attribute, time, space. You can't define those by something broader of which they are the part or the specific, you know, offer a specific difference. Okay, we come then to page 150 and 151. And we have some assignments that we can work through. All right, number one calls for giving synonymous definitions for the following terms. And I'll just go through a few of them, let each one of you try them on. Um, Pat, cemetery, number three. Graveyard or birthplace? Or burial place? <laughs> birthplace? <flight. laughs> You've been watching too many horror movies. <laughs> burial place? Oh. Okay. Um... Jay, do number seven, Garrett. Garrett is the uh, top room of the house, maybe the attic. Okay, so your synonymous definition is upper room, yeah. attic, upper room. something. Okay, uh, Melissa, infant. Big child. Mm, young child. Sure. Small <laughs> child. Small child. Yeah, young child. Hey, uh, Talking to Jay. Pete, uh, <laughs> number 19, scoundrel. Villain. Very good. Let's go to section two now. Construct definitions for the following terms by matching the defi definiendum with an appropriate genus and difference. This shouldn't be too difficult for you. We were to do the even numbers, so... Uh, let's go the other way now. We'll start with um, Pete. Would you please do brother? Male sibling. Okay, so you have sibling as the genus, and the specific difference is the male sibling. 
Yep. Then uh, let's take um, a U, and I'll have you do it. <laughs> Melissa? Ha, ha, ha. A female sheep. One female is genus, the genus they forgot to add was person. Because in giant, you, need, you can't use any of those words. Well, words. But we're not, we're not on giant. We're on hue right now. Oh, let's, okay. let's finish this. You said the genus is... Is sheep. Is sheep. Okay. So you mentioned the difference before the genus, and that's fine. I just want to make sure you know which is which. So the broader class is sheep, and then you're distinguishing male-female sheep, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then what's the problem with giant now? Well, they, they need to add in the word person on the genus because you can't, you can't say any of the other words to mean giant or midget, for that matter. You know, midget we have to do. But... See, you couldn't... Why can't you use man? Well, you could use... Oh, I guess you could use man. That's a midget, though, could you? Why well, not? Because all midgets aren't men. And these are all giants. What are they? All giants aren't... Aren't... Oh, okay. I was thinking... Are you confusing male and man? Man well, means man, human. There's man and woman there as a choice, so... Oh, I see. Well, but you could take the word man in the general or the specific way. Maybe that's the trick there. Yeah. Did you look back what he says he in the back? He says person in the back, too, so that's what I was... He says person in the back? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he messes up his own assignment? I would rather think that by man you can take it generically or in the uh, gender sense. And mm -hmm. so then a giant is going to be a very large man. Hmm. He's, he's a very large person, very small person. So, that's why I was confused, why they didn't add it. See, if you hadn't looked at the back, you would have you know, found it easier. I'm going to add person here. I, I had, uh, well, I had man, and I didn't think it was it seemed weird that you, because a giant could be... Well, it's man. You only thought of man in the specific sense because right. you saw a woman on the same list. I understand. Um, Jay, let's have you do number 16. Another... Uh, genus is parent, and the difference is female. Very good. Parent, the female parent. Okay, then Pat, would you do number 24, wife? Okay, a wife would be a woman that is married. The genus would be woman. The difference would be a married woman is a wife. Okay, anybody have any questions about uh, these exercises? In 4.6, the author gives us rules for definition by genus and difference because obviously these easy ones we've just had don't exhaust everything. And some um, of the ones that are offered are not real helpful. Some difficulties can be encountered. So let me just state the rules. I think his explanation should be clear enough for anybody who's read it. I'll state them and then we'll do the exercises. Rule one, a definition should state the essential attributes, not just accidental characteristics. Two, a definition must not be circular. Can't use gambles when you're trying to explain what a gambler is. Rule three, a definition must be neither too broad nor too narrow. It's got to include everything that the term applies to, but only those things the term applies to. Four, a definition must not be expressed in ambiguous, obscure, or figurative language, because then, of course, it's going to call for a further definition. And then rule five, a definition should not be negative where it can be affirmative. And that's because there are many more things which do not fit into a class than those that do fit into a class. But think about it. The, the, the class of... Uh, red objects includes the class of black objects, white objects, green objects, and so forth. And so if you define red in the negative way, then, or, or, or if you say it's not this, not that, and so forth, it's not going to be clear what you're left with. The assignment is found on page 155 to 156. I ask you to look at section two, and do the first 20. The book calls for you to criticize the following in terms of the rules for definition by genus and difference. 
After identifying the difficulty or difficulty, state the rule or rules violated. If the definition is either too narrow or too broad, explain why. And we'll do just a few of these so we get the hang of it. I'll begin for you. Uh, number two, knowledge is true opinion. Okay, the problem with that is that there are true opinions that don't amount to knowledge. I might have the opinion that, um, say, Duke is going to win uh, their basketball game this Saturday. That may be true. It's an opinion, a belief that is true. But we wouldn't say that I know that. And what do I lack? Proof or justification. So this is too broad. I think it violates rule number three. Did you all uh, get the same answer? Too broad. Mm. I said it was rule four. Rule four says the definition must not be expressed in ambiguous, obscure, or figurative language. Well, there's nothing figurative there. What about, what about uh, ambiguous? What's ambiguous? True. True is not ambiguous one of the clearest words in our language. There are different theories of truth. That doesn't make it ambiguous. We know what true means. Corresponds to the facts. States what is the case. No, I don't think there's any uh, figurative or ambiguous uh, defect in this. It's just that it's too broad. And is opinions the, the essence of knowledge? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's of the essence of an uh, of knowledge is a belief or an opinion that is true and justified. So, this example will be a little bit difficult because obviously there are disagreements between philosophers as to what knowledge amounts to. But but Plato covered too much when he said true opinion because not all true opinions are knowledgeable ones, and so that's why the answer I gave I'm sticking by it's a definition that's too broad. <laughs> okay, okay um, Pete, let's have you do number six. Honesty is the habitual absence of the intent to deceive. <laughs> um. I said that it absence or the habitual absence tends is more of a negative type definition, therefore it violates rule number five. Okay. What did you put, Jay? Well, that's what I had. That it's a negative definition? That and the fact that it's well. I was thinking that it wasn't really the way of describing what honesty is. So I would uh, honesty would be better defined as being truthful. Although I think that may be a little too broad there, but maybe not. Okay. Well, then you would think it violates rule one that it doesn't state the essential attribute of the species. Well, I, I put down both. I think five is the better answer, that it that it has a negative cast to it rather than telling us specifically what it is. Um, question. Go ahead. Uh, that, my question is, uh, can it violate more than one, or is it just basically violating one? Oh, I, I don't see any reason why it couldn't violate more than one. Okay, Ordinarily, you would focus on be. one. That's why I put down both of them. Yeah, I, I do think that the exercise calls for you to identify one of the rules, the, the most obvious one that it's broken. Okay, so all of them have to be violating? There should be a rule that's violated, okay. yes. Um, and will this require one? Um, Melissa, let's have you do number 12. A raincoat is an outer garment of plastic that repels water. Um, I think that that is a little too broad. The word of plastic doesn't have to be in there. 
Too broad or too narrow? The def the definition doesn't need to have of plastic in there. You said it was too broad. You don't have to have plastic in there. What you want to say is it's too narrow oh, okay. because plastic is in there. By making it plastic, you're restricting okay. what counts as a raincoat. There are some non-plastic raincoats. Okay. Okay. Very good. Um, go ahead. Could that also violate rule number one? That the essential attribute is a plastic? Uh, no, I think it... The rule that we've just talked about is what gets at that, that uh, it doesn't have to be plastic. But it is essential that a raincoat be an outer garment that repels water. So it doesn't seem that number one has been violated. Um, it's rather that it's too narrow a statement of the essence of a raincoat by adding something that doesn't have to be there, the plastic character of it. Pat, would you do number... Um, 13, a hazard is anything that is dangerous. Yeah, that would violate rule number three, being too broad. Mm -hmm. Too broad? Isn't it the case that everything that's dangerous is a hazard and everything that's a hazard is dangerous? Yeah, as far as, far as I can see it. Would be. Well, then why did you suggest that as the answer? Well, I was assuming there were... I can't think of any examples, but I'm assuming there are some cases where um, something that's dangerous wasn't necessarily a hazard. What would be dangerous that isn't a hazard? Something that has the potential to be dangerous. Then it's a hazard. It has the potential to be dangerous. The hazard is something that's been released or... Kind of no, I don't think that's correct. You're not using the word properly. What is the problem with this one, Jay? Uh, circular reasoning. That's right. Two. Violates rule number two. A definition must not be circular. Dangerous. That is, when you offer a, synonym, uh, a synonymous expression, you're not defining by genus and species. Anything that is dangerous, the giveaway here is that you didn't have a broad class narrowed down. Okay, what you have here is some, the reason why it's not too broad is because these two terms are used synonymously, hazard and dangerous. I think it believe was that it was from OSHA. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I want to do a couple more, then we'll be done with this. Let's try um, Pete. How about number 18? A cloud is a large, semi-transparent mass with a fleecy texture suspended in the atmosphere whose shape is subject to continual and kaleidoscopic change. I said that's very figurative. Thank you. Yeah, that one should just jump out at you. The rule that you shouldn't use ambiguous, obscure, or figurative language. Do you think many people would be helped by that as a definition of a cloud? Okay. Um, Melissa, you do number 20. Are you going to read it? Uh-huh. Oh. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Um, I said that it violates, I never can remember the numbers, um, five because it has the, um, the negative absence of disease or infirmity. No, it, I, I don't think it violates rule five because it says what health is and then oh, adds okay. not merely the absence. So maybe. So what is the problem with this definition? It should only state the essential attributes and doesn't need to add the rest. Mm. It doesn't seem to me that this is just accidental or incidental. I think it is essential. We'll find out when we look at the back of the book. <laughs> for sure. Until you do seems to me, I mean, my first guess would be uh, on uh, initial contact with this that it's circular, mm -hmm. that it's using a synonymous expression, well-being and health. What did the author say at the back of the book? It's too broad. But too broad? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was another possibility, I know. 
complete physical, mental, and social well-being. He says it's too narrow. This is too broad. Where are, I look are we arguing over what the author says here? <laughs> yeah. This is going to be a dispute. I think this is going to be a visual oh, dispute. Oh, I'm looking at three. Wait, what number is this? Two? We're looking at 20. No, but Roman numeral. I was looking, yeah, okay. He says too near. Okay. I was looking down here. Then he gets a bigger long quote from this guy. Okay. Anyway, do you see why it would be considered too narrow? There are other forms of health that are not physical, mental, or social. Okay. All right. I guess that last part threw me off. Spiritual health. Um, what What does the author say? He said there are philosophical issues involved here. Oh, well, there always are. But we don't have to bother to get into it if that's what he wants to talk about. <laughs> Okay, well that takes us through Kopi, his two chapters dealing with language and definition. We're going to stop for today, and what I'd like you to do in preparation for tomorrow is to make sure you're caught up with the Engel assignment that was given on language last evening. That should already be done, but you can brush up on that. And then I'd like you to read Kopi chapter 3 on fallacies. Kopi, chapter 3 on fallacies, and we'll go over exercises from that chapter tomorrow. The day following, we'll go over exercises out of uh, Morris Engel's book with good reason, and so you should be prepared, you should finish reading Morris Engel on fallacies for the day after tomorrow.